we've been preaching on the Jubilee. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. Space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. And thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee, and it's strange how that's spelled, to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of the atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. You shall hollow the fiftieth year and proclaim what? Liberty throughout all the land and all the inhabitants. And we said that's on our Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Thereof it shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession. And you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth be a year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. Why? For it is a jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. Father, okay. I'm like Jesus in the area of storytelling. That's been a part of my life. I think that it started back when I was a kid, and I loved fairy tales. So I'm still a big kid, right? Just fairy tales. And everybody in this room probably knows how fairy tales, the cliché, of how they end, right? And they what? Let's all say it together. They they lived happily. Turn to two people and say they lived happily ever after. Two people tell that. They lived happily. How many like that? I like that. I mean, would you like to live happily ever after? Wow. So I think that fairy tales. That I mean, Jack. Cuts down the beanstalk. Uh, yeah. Snow White is awakened with a kiss. Not a bad wake up. Dorothy finally figures out that the end of the rainbow is in Kansas. Yeah. If fairy tales began with the or end with the cliche of they lived happily ever after. They never begin with that. In fact, no sooner have, has the storyteller said once upon a time when you have a cyclone heading to the farmhouse in Kansas, you have uh, the two wicked stepsisters tormenting Cinderella. Yeah. In fact, it seems like the writers of fairy tales were bent on scaring the pants off of every kid <laughs> that read them. Because if you look at the characters of, and I'm going somewhere with this, you look at the characters and what they went through. Little Red Riding Hood's invalid grandmother lives on the other side <coughs> of a wolf-infested forest. And the three Billy Goats gruff have got across a bridge where a troll says, I'm going to eat you in order to go to grass to keep them from starving. And Hansel and Gretel had a GPS system like I did when I first bought mine. Years ago, I, you know, you could attach it to your front of your car the, and, and that thing I bought years ago and it would send you a wild goose chases everywhere. I mean, it was crazy. I tried it out and, and it was crazy. And their GPS was crumbs that the birds ate. And they ended up in a woman's house who loved to eat children. She was a cannibal. She loved to boil them first. Now, can you imagine the eyes of your children when you're telling them right before they go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> insurmountable odds grave danger is what made fairy tales work because in all of them there was a moment a shaping event a catalyst something twisted that thing to where it went from destruction in captivity and harm to liberty. 
in every fairy tale, if you go back, just about every one of them, they were liberated first, then they lived happily ever after. I begin to think that in the fairy tales, the Jubilee was written into it. Now before you get the happily ever after part, you've got to get free. I think that'll preach. You've got to have some freedom and liberty to get to that at the end, right? And that's exactly what religion has always done. Did you know that religion, in its core, religion wants you free? Mm -hmm. Now what religion has done is, religion, I preached last week on two trees, and every day we either pick a fruit from the tree of life, or we pick fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your own idea of what is good and evil. Your own idea of what you think is right and wrong. God's not telling you what's right and wrong. You're figuring it out for yourself. And religion gives you the fruit from the tree of knowledge. But in the ultimate of any religion is freedom. If you were to ask a Muslim, how do you get free? Uh, what's the process to get to paradise? He'll tell you. Well, it's very simple. All you've got to do is follow the five pillars of Islam. Which means praying five times a day. Some of us don't pray five times a day. And fast one month a year. Wow. Want to join Islam? <laughs> October, I believe, is refidum, and that is the time that you fast all day long to the evening hours. Then you can eat something. But all day for 30 days, 31 days, whatever it is. Hey, yeah. And you'll be free. That's Islam. The Muslim. But if you were to ask an Orthodox Jew, he'd say, no. The way to freedom is you have do's and don'ts. you got law. You do not mix dairy products and meat in the same kitchen. No, no. And you do not push a button on an elevator during Sabbath. Now, I was trying to remember when we were over in Israel, I think they shut the elevators down on Sabbath. So you walked your... 14 flights down or up. And if you do those laws, you can get free. God will, Yahweh will make you free. But if you ask a Hindu, which we've got several around here, I've got friends that have visited me lately in my office that are Hindu. Ask them, and they'll say, oh, all you have to do is go into your house where your homemade shrine is and offer three offerings a day. And if you do those right things, then you'll be reincarnated from the skunk you are into a better person. That's the freedom. The problem with religion is this. When you do all the same things they say that gives man freedom, you feel this missing thing. Something don't quite click. You feel something missing just like Adam and Eve felt like something was missing. You, you know what was missing? Their clothes. They were naked as jaybirds. Now, they were made naked and living naked, but at that moment, they didn't know it. And what happened? <clears throat> Have you ever had a dream that you woke up just sweating? Or women perspire. <laughs> and you were you were, are glistening and you uh, you were naked in downtown Jackson running down the street <laughs> or worse yet you were in super Walmart <laughs> you know when you and you're stark naked and you know what you do not do at that moment you don't go up and down the aisle and find the little knickknacks and stuff to go take home no you run over to the clothing section and hope nobody sees you and you get something on and that's what Adam and Eve did they ran over to the tree section and put on that, that fig leaf suit and that fig leaf dress and, 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 and were hiding from God because the voice I don't know that they ever saw anything. The voice comes walking like he does every day in the cool of the evening. And the voice says, where are you? You see, with religion and what happened to them, they missed it. You've got to get this. They missed it. They didn't know they were naked because they were not naked. 
Psalms 8 says that man was crowned with the glory of God. So they were surrounded with the garment of God Himself. That's why Paul said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wear Christ as your garment. When he said, put on the whole armor of God, what did he say put on? I'll tell you who is your salvation. It is Jesus. Who's your righteousness? It's Jesus. He's made unto us righteous. He is our peace. Amen. He is the belt of truth. He is those things that I'm to put on in my life. But they misunderstood. You see, and religion misunderstands it. They think it is a program or a performance. But it's not. It's a person. Jesus didn't say, come to religion. He said, come to me. Come to me. Come on, come to me. Come on, are you with me? Come to me. This is not anything about what I can do other than come to Jesus. That's interesting to me that when the disciples were in that boat in the middle of the night rowing, Mark says that Jesus came walking on the water. And notice the response. We know that story so well. But notice the response. Mark says that they were terrified. They thought it was a ghost. Peter, what do you think that is? Well, I think it's a ghost. <laughs> what do you think it is, John? Looks like it to me. They take a vote. They all vote ghost. I don't think it took quite place quite like that. Because the Bible says that they were terrified. That's a good word for wetting in your britches <laughs> at that movie that you went to watch. Friday the 13th. And it says, and they cried out. And that word cried out means to scream. They screamed like little girls. Have you ever heard a little girl scream? Some of you were little girls once and screamed. I mean, they scream like little girls. They're screaming. A ghost and they're screaming. I do it and I lose my voice. And then the ghost speaks six words. It is I. You know, we, we think he talks. He was a bass voice. Ten Commandments. Behold. It is I. Be not afraid. Now, you know what? That is a strange thing. If you think something's a ghost, and the only way it'll be a ghost, and they thought it was a ghost, is a man was out on that same lake and he drowned. Now, he's come back to take some folk with him. Now, if he's a real ghost, and we do sure think he is, a ghost can talk. And, you, and you're wondering who it is. He just says, it's me. <laughs> hey, it's me. Don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter makes the... <laughs> to me, it's really funny. He says, Lord, if that's you, notice something. They still can't make out who it is because he don't know who it is. If that's you. In other words, out in the water, in those waves hitting them in the face... He can't make it out. All he's got is a figure and a voice. Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. Well, if it's a ghost, he can talk. He's already said six words. He's going to say one more. Come. If it's a ghost, he's got a little something he'll whisper underneath his breath. Sucker. Come, sucker. I'll get you out of the water to drown you. My point is this. Why in the world would Peter risk everything that he had, his life, his destiny, and everything, on one word, if he thought it was a ghost, except for this? The same voice that came walking in the cool of the day was speaking in a human being. And he recognized the voice. Because my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. Hallelujah. Just think it's the gardener until he says Mary. And when he says Mary, she says Rabboni Master. She recognized the voice. I'm telling you what's saved my hide time and time again, congregation, is this. In the midst of my storms, because a storm will mock you. A storm will come and say, where is your God? 
I thought you had a promise. I thought that God said He'd come through for you. Look at where you're, you're at right now. You're going under in this situation. And it was what saved me was a voice that said, It's all right. It's me. Everything's going to be all right. And I follow the voice. And I'm here today. <laughs> How many of you have ever followed the voice? Come on, give it praise. Oh, Jesus. I want to give you a couple of instances of what the Lord's trying to tell us. Amos 5.5. 5. Thank you, Nick, for putting it up there. Verse 4 says, Seek the Lord and live. That's verse 4, that right before you get that, and then you go right under 5. And verse 6 says the same thing, Seek the Lord and live. Well, in the middle of where it says, Seek the Lord... It says, don't seek Bethel. Don't go to Gilgal. Don't journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile. Bethel will be reduced to nothing. What, what's he saying? Bethel is where Jacob has a dream. And the ladder is coming down from heaven. He has a spiritual experience. It says, God, from now on, I'll give you a tenth of everything. And he makes an altar there to the Lord. And that's Bethel. Gilgal is where Israel came across the... Jordan River and the first place that they camped and they built 12 put 12 stones as a memorial of God bringing us through on dry ground hallelujah what a wonderful place Gilgal was what's Beersheba Beersheba was where Abraham made a treaty with Abimelech and called on the Lord there and God spoke to Abraham at this place called Beersheba and at Beersheba is where his son dug a well and made an altar it was a my point is all three of those places were very significant spiritual places in Israel's history. They all knew about them. They knew the move of God there. And God says to, right here to the prophet, don't go back there. Very simple. Why? Because God moved in those occasions at those places. That's where He blessed. That's where He worked. That's how He did it. But He's... Not I was. Come on. He's I am. He's a very present help in time of trouble. And if you hang on to what happened yesterday, you'll miss what he's doing today. When the waves come in on the ocean, they will tell you look out for the incoming waves. Because it will resist are the outgoing waves. When it comes in and it goes back out, the wave that's coming in will be resisted by the wave going out. It just had already happened. It's over with. It's coming back. And it will resist the wave coming in. The biggest resistance to the move of God is the structures and mindset that we put on our churches expecting things to be done a certain way. And God says, I want to blow the socks off of every bit of that because I'm about to do some new things and you've got to see it a different way. I'm going to a new place. Anybody want to go with me? God says, Amen. Look at this scripture. Isaiah 54. Here is the voice now that I've heard in the storm. The voice speaking to me. And it sounded like a fairy tale to me. Single barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, burst into singing, cry aloud. Who? You that didn't travail with a child, you haven't had kids. For more are the children of the desolate, the person that hasn't had a baby, than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. In other words, God is speaking, and He says, to this woman. And is a woman like Hannah. Remember? Panina and Hannah, the two wives of Elkanah. Panina is having a baby every nine months. She's popping them out. Just pop, 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 pop. In the household, Hannah can't have one. She's barren. And there's an instruction to a person like her. Wow. Now, that amazes me for the fact that God is saying to a person who has yearned for a breakthrough in an area of her life, 
an area she cannot produce, and she's barren, and God speaks to her barrenness. Can I tell you something? Everybody in this room has got barren areas. Every one of us. There are areas in your life and mine that we're unfruitful in. We do not have in our bodies, in our, in our homes, in our families, in our walk with God. We've prayed, we've asked, we've, 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 we've sought for it, but it is like an elusive thing. It, 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 it's elusive. It, it, it's here and it's there. We go here and we go there trying to get, get this thing and, and, and it just stays out of our reach. You, you can't get your finger. You're barren in that area. Can I tell you, Jacob understood that. Jacob sees the beauty that he wants. I worked seven years for her. He worked seven years, but at the end of the seven years, it's elusive. Laban pulls her out of the scene. Another seven years. Can you imagine working? Look at your wife and say, 14 years for this, honey? 14 years to marry that girl. That's a lot of love. And he gets her. And she's barren. You get what you want, and it won't produce. Huh? It's out there. Finally, I've got it, but it's unproductive, barren. And that's what a person is. That areas of our lives. And here's this, the strangest thing. Is that God says, okay, in the midst of your barrenness, your begging, your wanting, your longing, Here's how you're to act. I want you to bust out in song. Right. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, glory to the Lord. Mm, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. You can't even see anybody's heels. I mean, you're down below the ground. I want you to sing. And I want you to cry loud. And the word cry loud is the same word used by the disciples. It means to scream. But it's not fear and terror like they screamed. It's the scream of anticipation. I want you to scream out anticipating something is about to take place. I want you to begin to sing that you are going to have more children than the other woman that's been having them all the time. It's coming my way. I want you to get a little song in your heart and sing it. I, I, I'm telling you. Expectation. Jack Cole was a minister back in the 40s and 50s in the healing campaigns. Had five people contact him. They were either paraplegic or quadriplegic. In wheelchairs. Could not walk. Said, would you come and pray for us? He set up a date. Went over to the, where they were at. Met with the five and the other people around. And he saw they didn't have any shoes. And he dismissed them. He says, I'll see you tomorrow. But you better bring shoes. On the day they showed up, the next day, I know this to be, we, these are truths. The next day they showed up, he prayed and all five of them slipped their feet into shoes and walked out there pushing their own wheelchair. Wow. Amen. And the re he, he let you know quickly, Jack Cole will let you know the reason why they walked out of here is because the moment I said, I'm expecting it to happen, and you better expect it with me. And if you've got an expectation, you better have something to walk in. Most of us want God to do something, and we don't have a high expectation of Him doing it. And the Lord said, if you begin to believe me for some things, I'll start doing some things. You gotta rise up a little bit in your level of faith and believe and anticipate. Can I have an amen? Look what he tells. Look what he says. Verse 2 Enlarge the place of your tent. Wow. And let them stretch forth the curtains of your habitation. Spare not. Lengthen the cords. Strengthen this. What's he saying? He's saying, Look, if you're gonna have kids, you're gonna need to have a bigger tent. And right now, you're still barren. And while you're still unproductive, I want you to begin to structure for growth. I want you to enlarge it. Because they're coming. And if you had the kids here, what would you do? You'd have to have a bigger tent. But I want you to see they're coming by faith. And I want you to enlarge by faith. Because they're going to come. And they did come in history. Amen. I feel like spitting all over the ground. I, I, you've got to catch this. Please, this is in my heart. If you're a visitor, then that's okay. <laughs> you may not get this, but I think our home folks will get this. Listen, 
My son came and preached to us and said, I had a nursery worker before I ever had any kids. And the reason I had them come and sit in my, that nursery is because he told me structure for growth. And they said to me, we don't have any kids. He said, I don't care. Sit in the room because we're believing for kids. Now he's got ten times the kids in his nursery we got in ours. It's because he's structured for growth. Yeah. Listen to this. In Acts chapter 1, you have 11 apostles in that upper room. One's missing. He hung himself. His name is Judas. But I'm telling you, God meant there to be 12. Now regardless of whether you think it was Paul or Matthias, it doesn't matter to me. But I will tell you this. 12 is the number of government. When God wanted a government upon this earth, which will run the government in the uh, millennial reign of a thousand years, He picks 12, um, 12 men called the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, and they become the governing agency on this earth for God. When you look in Revelation 12, you have a woman that's got a crown on her head with 12 stars. You get to the New Jerusalem, you have 12 gates with the 12 names of the 12 uh, tribes of Israel over those gates. Entrance into the New Jerusalem, you'll have to go through the government of God. But the whole thing is held up by 12 stones. 12 foundation stones, which are the 12 apostles of the Lamb. It didn't say 11, it said 12. Which meant the structure was broken. Had to be repealed, had to be rebuilt. And I'm telling you, God, what happens in Acts chapter 1 is they vote in Matthias. That's the last verse in chapter 1. The moment that they built the structure back, built the altar back like Elijah did, can I tell you what happened is, when the wine skin was made perfect, then the next verse says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven. God poured out the wine when the wine skin got ready. I tell you what God's waiting on springs of praise is to get this wine skin where it needs to be. Can the new wine come on somebody? The new one is about to be born. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't care what the devil stole from you in the past, what he's got a hold in your life that is missing. I'm telling you, 2019 for me. And my family is a year of restoration. Yes. Since I've been preaching this, yeah. I've seen things restored in my life. Yeah. I've had people that were at odds with me come to me and ask me to forgive them. <laughs> restoration is taking place this year. Yes. Amen. Amen. You can miss it or not, but I'm not going to miss it. And I'm telling you, it's happening this year. God's replacing things that have been stolen. Yes. When they tore down in the 1990s, one of the silos that held an atomic warhead that Joseph Stalin had put in place after World War II. Then they tore it down. Inside they found a letter. The letter simply said this, when you tear this down, would you please use these bricks for what they were originally intended for? They were meant to build a church, setting on site for a church. And Joseph Stalin took it under communism and built an atomic warhead silo. They said, when you tear this down, would you please put them back where they belong? And they built the 2,000 member capacity Cabriel Baptist Church in Russia that stands there today to say what the devil took under communism. God returned it under Christianity. God will return what's been stolen from Springs of Praise. You mark it down. You mark it down. You mark it down. God's about to 